Base 3, under the control of General Spears, was home to unquestioning loyalists. Many of Spears' soldiers believed the General's own image of himself, that he would be the one to retake the Earth with his xenomorph army, and he would be the savior of humanity. Perhaps it was a desperate hope in a post-Earth world. Perhaps it was out of fear to question the General. However, not all soldiers on the base shared this unquestioned loyalty. Such was the case with three Marines who defied the madness of Base 3. Magruder, Jason S., Private First Class. Peterson, Sean J., Corporal. And Renus R., also Private First Class. Concurrent with the arrival of Hicks, Newt, and Bueller, the small group had been following through on a plan to escape. They convened in secrecy. Food had been gathered, rationed for the trip out. How much did you get? Renus asked. Three days if we stretch it, Peterson said. Shit, the third marine, Magruder said. It's four days to the civilian terraforming colony, five if we stick to the canyons. So we'll be hungry when we get there, Peterson said. Listen, I was pushing to get this many meals. Spears has everything on this fucking base inventoried, down to the paper clips. Besides, the crawler will have e-rations, carbicons. Great, if you like greasy sawdust, Magruder said. Do you think the civilians will take us in and keep quiet about it? Peterson shrugged. They've dealt with Spears. They know he's over the edge. They'd be worried about him thinking they had a hand in helping us, if they did or not. My guess is they'll hide us and tell him they never heard of us. Still risky, Magruder said. How long you figure we got? A couple, three hours maybe, Peterson said. Spears and Powell will play Mad Doctor with the stowaways. Our general likes to watch the implants. I think it gives them a hard-on when those things shove their eggs down somebody's throat. If we can get to the Thousand Canyons and the Heat Faults, they won't be able to see us on IR. The crawler's camo should cover us from visual. The three looked at each other. At least it's a chance, Peterson said. They filed out into the hallway. At the South Lock Patton, Robert T., PFC, was on security. He leaned against the wall, his carbon propped at an angle next to him. He looked up, saw somebody approaching. He smiled, but didn't bother to assume any kind of guard-ready position. Hey, Magruder, you come to keep me company? Magruder drew near. Take some more of your money playing cards, you mean? Nah, I wish. Decker sent me here to relieve you. Circulating pumps on four are showing red in the backup chamber. Guess who's the only qualified pump tech on duty? Fuck, Patton said. Red means automatic suit-up. Why didn't somebody call when the cocksucker went yellow? Don't ask me, Bobby. I don't run things around here. The guard didn't see Magruder pull out a wrench. Sorry, Bobby, Magruder said. He slammed the wrench down on Patton's head. It made a sound like a thick rope slapping a plastic barrel of liquid soap. Let's go, Magruder yelled. Peterson and Renus came running up. Each of them had a carbon. Renus grabbed Patton's weapon. They had the codes for the inner locked door and cycled it open quickly. The outer door's codes were something else. While Peterson took a stab at the computer override, Magruder pulled climate suits from the racks. Not gonna happen, Peterson said. Security seals are dogged down tight. We'll have to burn the sucker. I'm trashing the alarms. Magruder nodded and moved up to the door. He pulled the plasma cutter he'd stolen from supply and thumbed the cutter up to full. Watch your eyes, he said. The brilliant plasma jet spewed, turning the inside of the lock into noon on a desert. It didn't take long. The security bars were designed to keep people outside from getting in, and the plasma jet ate through almost as fast as Magruder could move the welder. The locked door started open, then ground to a stop with a shriek still audible in the escaping air, stuck where a flange of partially melted metal caught the frame. But it was wide enough for them to get through. They clambered from the station into the cold darkness and ran toward the motor pool. The trio of deserters piled into the first crawler they reached. After a moment, the multi-wheeled machine lurched into the darkness and was gone. Travel time was as anticipated. The stolen crawler approached the plant, slowed. It came to a stop. Inside the small craft, the trio of deserters were four days from a bath and out of food. We made it, Renus said. I figured Spears would have been all over us by now. It's the terraformers that worry me, Magruder added. We're military. They may not be too happy to see us. The crawler's pilot at the moment, Peterson, nibbled at his lip, but said nothing. Radio's still quiet, except for stray stuff from third base, Rena said. Spears would have had them on a war footing, no transmissions, like there's anybody out there who gives a roach's ass. Yeah, Peterson said, but we ought to be picking up suit comms or Doppler or something this close. 
This isn't a place where people go out for a picnic now, is it, dickhead? They're all underground. Peterson glared at Renus, looked as if he were going to come up from the seat and take a swing at her. Bury it, Magruder said. We made it. That's the important thing. Spears didn't even come looking in this direction. We didn't see any flyovers. We're home free. I'll feel better when I'm inside, Peterson said. It'd be a hell of a lot easier to steal a ride off world here. Maybe. Maybe we could get some kind of asylum? You know, like political prisoners. Yeah, and after that you could run for president, Renus said. Magruder interjected. Christ, Peterson, we're AWOL. We don't need asylum. We need a ship, and I'll do whatever it takes to get one. With the crawler docked, the three marines exited and found themselves in the antechamber of the air plant. The locks were coded, but some helpful civilian had scribbled the admit number over the pad. The inner lock slid open, and the three padded inside. They might not take too well the visitors waving guns, Peterson said. Yeah, well, until we know which way the hydrogen fuses, I'll feel a lot better holding on to mine. He waved his carbon. An armed marine should be worth 30 unarmed civilian air farmers. The corridor was wide, dark, with high ceilings. The lighting was bad. Spooky in here, Peterson said, and hotter than the devil's dick, too. Some side effects of the gas generators, Magruder said. Their footsteps echoed as the trio walked down the corridor. Where the fuck is everybody, Magruder said. Maybe they're having a party, Peterson said. An orgy. I sure could use a little pussy right now myself. Little is right, Rena said. Hell, you couldn't make a mouse groan. Hey, fuck you. Like I said, with what? Way I hear it, you have to rent a microscope to find it when you want to take a piss. Peterson laughed, and Magruder chuckled. They were feeling better, to judge from the banter. They'd made it to safety. The general hadn't stomped them flat on the way. If the civilians didn't cooperate, fuck them. They could steal their transport and full-wing it to worlds elsewhere. What's that on the wall? Peterson said. What? Where? Renus tapped Magruder on the shoulder. Over there, to the left. The three moved. Why the hell don't they have any lights on in here? Christ, it's like a tomb. Magruder pulled his flashlight and pointed it at the wall. The circle of light thrown by the bright halogen lamp showed a convoluted and ridged overlay on the wall. Grayish, like flattened loops of intestine. Some kind of sculpture? Renus said. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Renus and Magruder turned to look at Peterson. What? Magruder demanded. I... it's... I've seen this shit before. So? When I was on guard duty at the Queen's Chamber. What the hell are you talking about? Renus wanted to know. The fucking alien Queen's Chamber. This shit is all over the wall in her chamber. Magruder shone his light farther along the corridor's wall. The stuff continued, spread so it covered the entire wall from the floor to as far up as the light would shine, all the way to the ceiling. Both Renus and Magruder spun, their carbons pointed at the third man. What? Peterson wiped something from his face, a clear, slimy goo. What the hell is that? Renus asked. Peterson looked up at the ceiling. Renus and Magruder looked up too. The glob of slime apparently marked Peterson somehow as the first target. He raised his carbon and started blasting, waving it back and forth, spraying a 10mm fan of steel-sheathed lead. The armor-piercing bullets sang as they struck the ceiling. The roar of the exploding propellant smashed against the ears of the three marines, deafening them. Renus and Magruder brought their weapons up, but not in time. The things dropped from the ceiling, peeled away from the convoluted resinous base relief sculpture, invisible until they moved. The first alien fell on Peterson, slamming its second jaw efficiently through his helmet. He screamed, a wordless bleat, full of terror. The thing bound up like a giant grasshopper, Peterson held in its claws like a doll. The alien holding the man leapt toward the wall, reached it. Another alien, two, three of them, unfolded from the wall, right in front of the marines. Renus fired, and the closest alien shattered under the hail of hard metal, spraying yellowish fluid in all directions like a popped water balloon. More of the things dropped from the ceiling, sprang from the walls, charged Renus. Die, motherfuckers! The cyclic rate of the M41E carbon was, in theory, nearly 700 rounds per minute, slightly more than 11 rounds a second. With the weapon held continuously on full auto, therefore, a 100-round magazine would be exhausted in a little over 9 seconds. It was the longest 9 seconds of Renus's life. Three heartbeats after the magazine ran dry, one of the things sprang at her, stabbing its tail right above her left kidney. Her scream turned into a choked-off liquid gurgle. 
The aliens had saved Peterson for implantation, but Renus was nothing more than fresh meat. The last thing she did before she died was to trigger the grenade launcher on her carbon. The 30mm explosive shell hit the wall at an angle, bounced upward, and went off somewhere near the ceiling. The explosion washed the corridor with clean fire and deadly shrapnel. Magruder ran, driven by fear and adrenaline, the acid burns on his suit trailing acrid smoke. The blast wave hit him. He staggered, nearly stumbled, but kept on his feet. Ahead was a doorway marked Interior Life Support. Magruder reached the door, slapped frantically at the admit panel. The door slid open. He jumped into the room, pressed the closure control, held it until the door slid shut. Jesus. Jesus. Fuck. Safe. He was safe. For now. He had to find a way out of there, fast. He looked around frantically. Something clattered, a rattle of claws on a metal grate. Magruder looked up. He saw one of the aliens overhead on an expanded aluminum mesh ceiling plate. Fuck! He snapped the carbon up and fired. Half a dozen rounds hit the grate, some of them got to the creature. It fell, like a puppet with its strings cut, collapsed on the grating. Acid dripped, burned the grate, the floor beneath it, raising smoke and a stench. Magruder backed away from the acid rain, slammed into the wall. Something banged on the floor, the thin metal dented inward as if it were no thicker than foil. He lurched away from the pain, felt a piece of his back jerk out. He screamed wordlessly in pain. The shock hit him as the blood spewed from the hole in his back. He stumbled through the pool of acid eating away at the floor. His boots began to smoke. His feet took fire, blistered, and began to char. He leaned against another door opposite the one the things tore at. The door opened behind and he fell backward. Looming above him, something. An alien. No. It wasn't a thing, it was a man. Thank God. Then he saw it was Spears. The wages of treason are death, Spears said. He smiled. Spears had watched it all. The initial desertion, the frantic ride through the canyons, the entry into the air processor plant. This fool thought he could just steal a crawler and escape. Never even looked for the hidden cameras on board the stolen property, the cameras that sent every moment of the trip back to Spears to enjoy at his leisure. Every word, every fart, every bump on the frantic ride. Just as the surveillance equipment had picked up the attack only moments ago. True, some of the network had been put out of commission by the drones, webbed over or covered by the resin secretions as they built their nest inside the plant, but plenty of photomutable gel eyes had remained. All of it had been recorded, fed to the computers at third base where the tactics would be broken down and studied, and used to extend his knowledge of his alien troops. The three deserters had panicked, lost it, and that disgusted Spears. Real marines would have used controlled bursts, overlapping their fields of fire, and walk through the drones to safety. But humans were weak, filled with fear, and they lost control. Their emotions damned them. Had three aliens been armed as the deserters, the wild strain would not have been able to touch them. That was what a real trooper was, one without fear. One without the emotional entanglements that came from being born of a woman. In a way, Spears felt a kinship with the aliens. He had come from an egg and sperm, but had been carried to term without the uncertainty of a living mother. The Marine at his feet, Magruder, stared up at him. G General thank God. You fucked up, son. Fouled your jets right across the tubes. Because you are weak. But you served your purpose. Every little bit helps. They'll be watching the recording of that chicken shit run you did for a long time. What not to do classic example of bad tactics built on an even worse strategy. He turned. A pair of troopers in full combat gear stood nearby. They were nervous, fidgety, the stink of fear rising from them. Not much better than this scum lying on the floor, but at least they obeyed orders. It was what he had to work with, for now. I'm done with this, Spears said, waving at Magruder. The drones are hungry. Give them supper. Magruder screamed. No, you can't. Please. He struggled to rise. One of the guards opened the door. The aliens were about to break through into the next room. The wall shuddered under their blows. Please! Please! The two marines shoved Magruder toward the door. He stuck his arms and legs out, trying to stop himself. The door slid shut with a grating noise. Spears watched through the plastic viewplate set in the door as the alien drones breached the wall and stormed into the room. Magruder's voice filtered through the closed door. He kicked at the first alien to reach him, but it was a wasted effort. Spears turned away. 
Let's go, he said. We're done here. The two guards practically leapt to obey. That brought another smile to Spears' face. A little example did wonders to keep the troops in line. Yes, sir. Indeed it did. As they were leaving the complex, Spears took a short detour through one of the newer egg chambers. A mere dozen eggs rested there on the alien-constructed floor, all fairly fresh, only a couple of days old. He had surveillance gear everywhere. He knew where there was no danger of these units hatching anytime soon. Plus, the doors, left open deliberately so the drones could move the eggs unimpeded, still worked. He had a trooper crank the doors shut so he could be in the room for a few moments without interruption. He liked to do this, visit the eggs. The rubbery, fleshy shells with the flower petal lips still clenched tightly together, protecting their precious cargo. They touched something in Spears. He was not a man given to deep introspection, no naval picker to worry over the unchangeable past or unburned future. He was a doer, not a ponderer. Still, there was a cold and merciless beauty to be found here. These were unborn warriors out of the greatest warriors man had ever met, and Spears was a man of war. With two guards standing nervously alert, Spears walked to the nearest egg, squatted, put one hand out to feel the roughness of the living container. The eggs were tough. Even under the G's, they still managed their integrity. Spears grinned, stroked the egg as if it were the head of a faithful dog. The troopers moved around. Spears could feel their fear. He grinned again, partly because he knew they were scared, and he wasn't. Partly because growing down his uniform pants leg was a fairly solid erection. As long as he squatted there, stroking the egg, it didn't show. He chuckled at his own hormone storm. That didn't happen much anymore. He'd managed to sublimate his sexual drives into more important things. But the little head did rear now and again. Not that he found sex unpleasant, no, that wasn't the problem, just that it took too much time and energy to indulge in it these days. Of course, when he'd been younger, he thought he would live forever, and he would fuck anything with a hole and a pulse, and even the latter wasn't strictly necessary. Spears came back to himself. He patted the egg and stood, his sexual excitement cooled. A less patient man than himself might have missed the whole opportunity to develop an invincible army. He turned to the troopers. Let's move out, Marines. He wouldn't have to tell these men that twice. Spears had an impeccable ability to account for all goings on within the base. Nothing went on without his knowledge. His men knew they were being watched at all times. Or at least they should be smart enough to assume so. The general was meticulous and left little to chance. The trip back to the base would be a few days, and in this time there was an unexpected variable. Second-in-command General Powell had sought the help of Hicks, revealing all the details of Spears' sins and madness. The two had formed an alliance, and a true mutiny was not far off. In this series I'm recounting the Earth War, as depicted in the Aliens comic series. The accounts are explored as originally published, despite certain names, locations, and other events having been altered over time. For more on the Earth War, you can check out the Accounts of the Earth War playlist on the end screen, and stay tuned for the latest videos. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like. And you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland Utani Executives, Emuric, and Lady Anne, part of our Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.